good day. Welcome to you folks from Soldiers. It is with great pleasure to see you visiting Studio One, the pioneer leader of Jamaican music. I'm going to take you inside that you can see all around and see where it all began. Clement Dodd and his Studio One music. That is so accepted in the world today, which I'm really thankful for. Yeah, here he is. People run, come, let me give you a demonstration about music education to admiration, y'all. Do it, Jack. I'm Johnny Moore. They call me Dizzy. Is it Johnny? I'm Leonard Dillon, leader founder of the group Ethiopians. Lincoln Sugar Minot, youth promotion, Black Roots production, you know, singer, songwriter, producer, and all works. Coming out originally from the studio of Studio One. Welcome, don't know, one love and I Hi, this is Ken Booth. And I'm from Kingston, Jamaica. I'm a singer and entertainer. Yes, um, yours truly, Alton Ellis, and um, here for your interview. Jeans was in, the dangaree, you know, everybody, yeah, yeah. But for this climate down here, it's too good to write it. No matter what the people say, these sounds leads the way. It's the art of the day from the last teacher. I can stay it. Hop into the dark to the very last drop. I'm Clement Dodd, better known as Sir Cox and Downbeat, master of the Royal Society of Jazz and king of sound systems. <laughs> Producers, majority of the best music in Jamaica. The backyard DJ adds his own special flavor. He turns down the vocal track and dubs his own patois rhyme schemes. No, no, no. The first time when I went to Studio One, you know, the first time you go to the studio, you're waiting your turn, right? And I would take a pee pee just to see. They would come out. They would run me out there. <laughs> Whenever we, we started the session, I didn't really sit down much. I was always dancing, they, so they, they used to call me the dance and operate. Everything was going like 24 hours, like this train. Recording, voicing, cooking, singing, you know, son, and about six person plant inside, it was just going like much, all day, you know? Uh, born in Kingston and brought up in Kingston. You know, basically from uh, Orange Street to East Street, you know. And when you were growing up, that was their music in the house? Well, yes, we had a uh, uh, Mar Martha Richards uh, radio. And we used to listen to the foreign station a lot. 
like yeah. Voice of America, listening to people like um, Bill Eckstein and um, Cyril Vaughan, Lionel Lampton, Louis Jordan, you know. And, and what did your mum do? She had a, a, like a grocery store and I was quite busy there helping and um, when I get home from work, you know, because at that time I was a mechanic, so we get off work four o'clock, so by 5.30, we'll be playing music and people would expect that and come from other part of the city, stay outside and enjoy the music, buy a lot of beer and stuff like that. When did you first start playing in the store? In the late 40s, early 50s, yeah. So how old are you then? It'll take a bit of <laughs> calculation to figure that, yeah. Great Sebastian, he had a sound system which I used to go by on weekends and listen. He, he was playing um, rhythm and blues too, he was playing a lot of Wyoming Harris and stuff like that. Well, I first met Mr. Dodd through a DJ that he had by the name of Count Machuki, who was the first disc jockey in Jamaica at the time. Was he speaking? On the no, mic? the speaking um, wasn't really in the swing. I came back and, and changed that with a lot of toasting, you know. Did you get uh, that idea from America? America, right. And then I got together with Count Machuki and, you know, would just toast to him like I've heard it on the radio station. No, well, um, Coxon wasn't the first sound system, but um, Coxon's sound system was the first sound system to create these jockeys that would use the microphone in between records. All the other DJs before our time, they would only just put on the records or either dance with a girl or drink a beer, but it wasn't anything exciting. Count Machuki and myself, we are the two persons that started this mic business. The way the rap, you, you felt involved because it sounds like they're rapping especially to you, you know. And this is stuff we came back to Jamaica with that our sound took off because my sound was the only sound that doing stuff like that. Say, look before you leave and drink before you walk. Mom, before you jump in the mother sky, love. Cause you know this is a high man, you got a real gen. Man, if I want to hold up your hand, you call me no way I drink. In the early, well, this little tree here was very small, huh? the sake tree here. And there was a big black mango tree right there. Basically, that cooked it. There was a big black mango tree. 
What? God used to write those mangoes every second. Because if a hundred artists is into this yard, and every man that climbs is like you cannot find no more than two. When you find two, you will never find another one. And if someone else climbs, you'll find two. And you can't find another one. And if this man climbs, he'll find two. That's the way. It was like a joke here, man. Everyone feed up with his mango tree. So, so where did you get the idea to go to America? Well, in the early days, it was a popular um, thing of the recruiting men for Florida, you know, to either work in fruit or vegetable or the sugar cane. But um, that was like the idea of early means of making some good money within a short period. So it was everyone Jamaican? Yeah, 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 all Jamaican. So did you mix with the Americans at all? Or? Well, at work. Yeah, at work we mix with it. And uh, weekends, you know, when you go party, you mix a lot with the Americans. So with the parties being town or? Yes, more, yeah, you would say in, the, in town. Have you ever said it would be jukeboxes. When we go to like um, live shows, then it's quite different with the band. Because you didn't have sound system in America at that time, just the jukeboxes. Well, when you're driving in high, it makes you think you're driving in low. Well, when you hit 85, still think you're going slow. Well, the closer you get, the faster that cat like goes. Get up, little car. I gotta go catch my gal. Well, she's riding in the cat like riding with my best friend. While I was there, I sent um, the amplifier. Uh, along with a lot of records and stuff like that. So you knew that was what you were going to do? Yes, and um, I sent diagram of how old like the box to be built. Then my old lady got involved, gave out the boxes, and she just started. She, as a matter of fact, she was the, the very first female DJ in Jamaica. I get ideas from some of the jukebox, you know, to build these box with a lot of glass and fancy stuff and writing on it. When the amplifier, the power of the amplifier was much less, it wasn't strong enough to break the glass. So we went for beauty, you know. So they made it of glass? Yeah, yes, certain spots. drums were over on that side, the bass man right there, and um, the arms would be here, and the vocals would be in, uh, somewhere in the middle there doing that thing. You know. Well, yes, this back microphone was Bob Marley, famous microphone. And up to now, you can't go no higher than this in pseudo microphone. It's a normal. This is the top of the line. Cedric Brooks, Cedric or Roland or Tommy, 
Why was he separate from that? No, he used to play, he used to play what the guitar wants to play, spam, spam, well, that's why we call him the Scapian. I notice uh, while working generally, I usually find that coming from the back of a speaker, there usually is a, a softer, heavier sound of the bass. So I actually created a bass box where I put an aperture at the back and put a mic at the back. So in other words, not the front of the speaker, the back. Came back, fresh ideas, big boxes, attended um, the popular sound system of the day, see what they were doing. And um, Jew Creed was a friend of the family. So I had the records. So I used to go around, play them on his sound system, so as to see how the the dance fan would accept it. On well, his sound system? And his sound system. Or he let you try it out? Or? This was doing a lot, a lot for him because I was playing record that he didn't even know. It was many sound systems in those days. Sound system had just begun. Because um, orchestra started to fade out around 1952. All the orchestras start to leave Jamaica and start to make their bass in England. So do you think he knew that you were, you were training to start competition? Or? Well, maybe, but he wouldn't really figure me that um, much uh, competition to him because he's a b bigger person and um, in the business well established, you understand? There was another man around who was Duke Reed, the Trojan. And the contest used to be between Duke Reed and Sir Coxon's downbeat at all time. I got a job at um, Bacham Milan. And uh, I think this is where we really hit it strong. I put the two of them together. Same clash? Yes, as a double sound for one night, Duke Reed and Coxon. So the booking was um, between me and Duke. Well, Duke was the senior sound, so he pulled the crowd. Himself, Count Machuki, was the disc jockey, and, and myself were at that dance, monitoring the sound. Duke opened the dance, and I would come on about 12 o'clock in the night. And um, surprisingly, we really upset the whole thing because they figured that I was the man of the evening. And this was around 1954, 55. And was that exciting? Very excited because Duke Creed himself was really a big sound too. Being um, a young sound at that time, they thought maybe I was able to play two hours, but after they see how I held the crowd, then they just sent home Duke and let me play for the rest of the night. Coxon grew up with we. Duke Reed was an ex-policeman. So because of that, I think the crowd would follow Coxon more. Although him, Duke Reed, used to have a good following, but the regular boys, as I would call it, the regular boys, the corner boys and the street fellows, then everybody cling to Coxon because we are all coming through the same tracks. So what we thought of playing, if you came over and started playing songs that people never heard before and they move into it, to keep them in that groove, to play another good song that they are familiar with, to keep that you know groove going, then you might hit them with a, a new song. 
but you have to make certain that it's something good enough that could keep them going. Well, my name is Winston Sparks, a.k.a. King Stitt. I was born in Kingston, year 1940. Jackie heard a guy whistling. And Jackie said, that's E sharp, you know. And Roland said, yes. And Roland took up his arm and led that. And finds it was E sharp and said, you, you're going to be a great musician. My name is Lassels Perkins, born Jamaican, Kingstonian. To be totally frank, there was, there was something about Lee Perry that up until this day have me mystified. He's a mystical individual. Every artist in Jamaica those days as if you don't break that barrier, you don't beat barrier, you, you, it's like you're not reaching nowhere. So you have Juke's fan coming there touting for Juke, you have my fan touting for me. Then if there's a, town, a t third sound, you have fans from them come there. So it's actually organised to be a, a clash? Yeah, that's right. You know. So we'd clash and then sometimes those clash work all oh, for each person. But if you're not really playing that, suitable for the people, the people down you <laughs> and then. So would that be, would you have a different, do you each have your own sound system? Yes, each of us had all. So it would be one at one end and the other at the other end? And, and yes, and sometimes we are like about here, because although this may be uh, the platform, my sound, the other person's sound, the other person there, and the other person there, but the speaker box, it's spread all over. So as to cover um, the dance hall properly, you'd have three of us in this corner here. We have um, a box each. There it goes. So when you switch from one to the other, you don't hear much difference because the box is there, it's only that if one sounds better than the other, it's quite clear. Kingsland could accommodate at least probably more than 4,000 people. 4,000? Yes, Kingsland was a really a big place. It, it, Kingsland take up a block, one block. It take up from Church Street to Lovely. The height of the, the sound clash was when we started uh, making local recording because that time you could have more songs than your competitor and better songs if your um, recording was good. That excel you to the top. See you be real key of being a jolly thing. It was thought about you've got you to the cream of the crop. And you don't be a sort of a musical power, or you become a world slow. To keep uh, the identity from the, the folks, we used to scratch, scratch the label, <laughs> not even the label. Uh, the label also the names. So where did you get that idea? <laughs> I wonder where, but I wasn't the only person doing it, you know. Everybody who had a good record that was, uh, wasn't popular. They erased, erased the name and the label because sometimes you'll be able to track the record because you know what label it's on. Because, um, of erasing the song, 
you had to really give it a name. So, um, you had songs like Cox and Hop, Don't Be Shuffle, and, and stuff like that. How long did you have, like, say, Cox and Hop? Yeah. How long did you own it before someone else had it? Well, Cox and Hop, I don't think anybody ever gets a road to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. In America, the rhythm and blues was kind of fading, dying out. Then came the rock and roll. But the rock and roll didn't go over strongly in Jamaica. So about that time, we realized we had to really make some music of our own to keep the people happy. So, um, went in the studio now and start recording. So the first couple of times I went inside, we did a little calypso there, a little tango, you know, danceable, right? And um, we did some rhythm and blues, tried to copy the rhythm and blues with that driving beat. And um, after a couple of sessions, you see how the people accept it. They felt that, you know, he was on a good track. He was doing recording at the time for his sound, not for, not for publication. You know, it was like dub plate, because all the other sound system usually go to America and buy the same songs that he went and bought two weeks ago or three weeks ago. So he couldn't stay ahead of them and playing the same song that they are playing. So he began to record his own thing to play on his sound. We did a um, reference disc, which is now called Dub, Dub Plate. And you'd make your reference disc and you come to your party and find out that the people love it so bad. So if you have 
more than one um, set system because at one time I had five, you understand? So I would have to cut five dub off of that um, specific record. <laughs> When we started, um, we didn't have an idea this could be a business. This record was saleable. We know it was suitable and we was trying to satisfy our dance fun and things like that. You understand? But we didn't have a clue that this could really work out into something saleable. So, so do you remember the, the musicians you picked, first of all? Well, yes, I started early with Kluge and um, Ronald Alfonso, Johnny Moore, um, Judge Jerry, and quite a few. We were playing on so much free party, and the word was getting around, and then everybody is happy to know is Jonathan from off the corner that they know is singing this song, you know? So were the people, and were the musicians, did they come to the party to hear it? Oh, yes, 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 man. Roland never miss a party. <laughs> He's always there. And, you know, even the vocalist, if he has something that is current and moving, he, he has to be seen, show himself and, you know. And then the dance hall now. You see the talking about dance hall? Dance hall was long ago. Then I would have to go to the dance hall to hear the dub. When I did that song, You're No Goody, I asked him which dance he's going to take it tonight because he have three set, number one, number two, number three, right? And he told me, well, he's going to take it to Forrester's Hall so I can meet him out there. And I went there, and the first night I didn't hear it because when Machuki, the selector, he selects how he feels, so I'll be there the whole night and I don't hear my song. And then I'd go back another night, and I hear, you're no good, and everybody dancing, you know? One of the early records we released was Easy Snapping, and that was like um, about a year and a half, two years after it was um, actually recorded. But it was so strong, and people were saying, don't be trying to make a record of that. I would say, you think it will sell? I say, yeah, man. So we'll give it a try. And that was the start of the business because then we realized, you know, it could be a business because records like that sold a lot. The island is J.A., Jamaica. The North Coast has a steel band or two and enough calypso to make your Arthur Murray money well spent on a honeymoon in Ocho Rios. 
But chances are you'll miss the real pulse of this island, the real sound. Oh, it can be heard just a few steps from Duns River Falls, just a 24-inch speaker away from the Jamaican Hilton. But it isn't yet a part of the modified American plan. So you'll fly home humming, welcome to Jamaica, where the rum come from, without having heard one skank guitar chord, not one bulldozing bass riff, not one wailing lyric of J.A.'s heartbeat, reggae. Welcome to Jamaica, where the reggae come from. started at Brentford Road here about six to one, you know, yeah. And was that a big step? Well, yes, of course, because um, we could spend more time putting the records, the sounds together, so you'd get a perfect record. When you hire a studio, you're kind of watching the clock on the wall, and sometimes you accept a, a take just because of time is running out. But when you have your own studio, you know, you try to get perfection and you stick to that. At that time, I was the only person in Jamaica who was recording steadily with a in house band. Do they pay the wage Do they, for the week or for a session? Or? No. Um, after we got things going and was certain of ourselves now, then I started a weekly arrangement with the band. The, the band would play from Monday to Friday, say 10 to about 4 in the evenings, 10 to 5, you know, around that time. And that was a weekly thing we had going. So. And did, did people like that arrangement? Or? Yeah, man, they love it. And you see, why that went over um, strongly is that the only place that was hiring um, musicians steadily per week was the hotel. And what they was making here, they was happier recording here than the hotel. The hotel wouldn't pay that kind of money. Was it also that they could play more interesting music? Yes, because the hotel, they strict to, uh, stick to the calypso and the little, you know, ballad here or there. But here, they come in and never know what they're going to end up playing, you know. How, how often did you work? Well, we worked. It was like a daily situation and um, everybody looked forward to it because um, we were enjoying what we were doing, you know. When we just got started. Um, the bass player, Chloe, he was more or less the upfront person. When we come in to record, you would say, everybody has the line. That is to say that everybody has to be 
mentally prepared to do the job because everybody's getting paid, so everybody got to have a input. <laughs> it's not that you're getting ten dollars to arrange and I'm gonna get five dollars to pay. Everybody's collecting the team, so everybody has got to have an input in the thing. Yeah. When we was playing the boogie boogie and the, the shuffle and thing like that, we realized that we were definitely swatting or copying the American stuff. But after playing and experimenting along the way, we realized we could do something on our own. And then just for that difference, this is why we decide to really come up and stick to the scale. So you thought we want to make some in Jamaican? Some Jamaican sound, true Jamaican sound. Of scare came scatterlight because um, we were in the studio here, and after we experimented and got it over, it was the men inside here that's doing most of the um, the scar. So we just gave them the name, the scatterlight, you know something to identify that they were definitely in ska. We decided on, on drafting some of the people that played in the studio, those who feel could put a very dynamic group together. And so we did that. We called on a Makoka Alfonso as, as outsiders and um, Jajeri. Did you release records by them straight away? Like the first Scatterlights record? Oh, yes, because when Scatterlights came about, it had developed into um, a record business. In the early stage, when I was recording people like um, Kluge and stuff like that, we thought this was only for our sound system and the, the dances. So after releasing a couple and realized it was so successful then, Realize everything now. But did you think of yourself as a ska band or a jazz band or a Jamaican? Or the name was Scatterlight, was a ska band. You know. We played other music. Sometimes we play a waltz or two, or sometimes we play one of the American pop things, but our basic aim was to propagate ska. You know. They seemed to record a lot, a lot of material very quickly. Well, yes, because they were, they were the cream of the musician, you know, available. Because after you have Roland and you have Tommy, then you have the two best um, horns man there, tenor. Jackie was very, um, Johnny was very good. Not to mention um, Don Drummond's. So I always imagine it was Don Drummond's leading the group, is that not? Well, he was so popular that some people would figure he was the leader, but at all times it was really Tommy. Yeah. But um, when it come to session now, Dan would come to the session with his, his own um, composition. You understand? Even more than the rest of the guys. What we did were like backing vocals. We had vocals who come in and we would um, put the music together for the vocalist. They'd come with a, 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 
a set of lyrics and they probably have a melody sometimes, but as far as the arrangement of the music, the musicians generally put it together. Would the singer be in the room when you recorded? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like though no, when you, um, you lay with him, everybody had to work as uh, the mics were limited and I guess the tracks were limited too. Yeah, well, where you get the melancholy to know is from the Danjoman's um, writing. He has that sound, you know. Was that, did, I mean, was that to do with how he felt, or just did you like Well, that? yes, uh, uh, how he felt, and he was like that, you know. And did you like that? that yeah, we love that, because um, it's like the uh, wind instrument kind of lay back, and then the, the rhythm is pumping, and the <laughs> it's just like the arm the, the, uh, uh, just lay, lay back, and the rhythm section is pumping, you know. So it just give you that double feeling, you know. It was good. It's not like did a lot of tunes. We did some before we were named Scatterlight, and Scatterlight lasted for about a year. And we, we did a lot of songs in that year, because like I said, actually every day we were here in the studio, and it's, it's like a day's work. Uh, nine to five, we'd come in and we'd work, and we don't have any set time to get out. So we'd work till we, hey, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm not enough for the day. Come on in. You're welcome to the Success Club. This is where we had all the good vibes going in 1960, 61, 62. Right here was the good old Success Club. This is where we had um, the good Monday night dances with Count Hazy, Sir Coxon Downbeat, 
We had a lot of clash here too, dance clash. Jew Creed, Sir Coxon, Lord Coos, yeah. But it was all fun. It was all fun. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. Hey, come on up. Come on up. I've been to Jew, she has one of a great old fan. Yeah. See you yeah. This was a great um, fan of ours in the 1960s. All these men. <laughs> made it good, you know. All these men was great guys. Yes. So where was the DJ and where were the sound systems? Inside. 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 Yeah, 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 no, because the best it, music, it, it, music, it, it, music, 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 Success was the main fun place. Yeah. A lot of fun. You can't say yes when it's success. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere you go, they will tell you that success was a good success. Success was the place. Yeah. I'm going to go to the club. I'm going to go to the club. It's like we're going up here for a little soda. You can come in. Yeah, come yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
to the regular place. I'm going to say I did it. Right through the night, you know, that people coming inside your house, so, you know. It's uh, loud, so it travels for a distance. We need more people far away to hear the sound. But sometimes you have a dance here, then right in front here is the neutral art. Right in front here. Sometimes you have another step over there. So it's who is playing the best music to attract the crowd. So did you like the competition? Yeah, I like the competition all the way, all the way. I had a lot of respect um, for Duke because um, he's the elder of us, right? And uh, the friendship went back to my parents knew him. The competition was just like when you are in the dance hall. But when you meet together as men, you try to be, you know, cool and all right. It was very diplomatic between the both of them because Duke, Cox and always treat him with disrespect. Duke is a older man than, than Cox, you know, and Cox, you always treat him with disrespect. Hello, Mr. Reed, and treat him like that. But when him turned back, he was like, damage him musically, see me. <laughs> yes, son. So it was just this thing going on between them, and Mr. Reed is a man that, you know, just people and, and their ways because. He always have this gun at his side and have this grumpy face. Juki got a liquor store and the studio. The liquor store is downstairs and the studio is upstairs. But he's got a, a, a speaker box wired to the, the liquor store, right? So whatever is going on upstairs, he can hear it. And remember, if what he hear he don't like, he's coming upstairs with all them guns, you know? <laughs> The, 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 the leak in regards to Treasure Island Studio One now. See the one of that song, that, that street song, from you hear it, all the mistakes you like and everything about it, you're gonna like that. It, it does have that song, that catching song, you know, with Jackie Me Too behind it, you know, that Jackie Me Too feel. And that was what I mean by the leak. Duke Tune was stiff and straight, you understand, and to the point. No, no, no leaning that way and that, it was just, that, that, that's, that's different to the recording, you know? I can't remember on one occasion, I was sitting in the studio and he normally have Tommy McCook and, and this um, saxophone player called Marquess. I remember Marquess, right? So whenever there is any mixing, when they are mixing the, 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 the tune, them, right, Tommy or, or uh, Marquess would be there and one day we were there and they were mixing a song and Joe Creed was sitting down and observing what was going down. So he heard something that we didn't hear, you know, and he asked, um, he asked Errol to stop the tape and said, he looked at us and said, didn't you hear that? So I said, no. He looked at Marcus and said, didn't you hear that? Marcus said, no. He said, run the tape again, <laughs> right? And when, when Errol played about the tape, we still couldn't pinpoint what he was on about. So, where I was sitting, I was sitting, um, the, the mixing board was, it's like the mixing, Jukit was in front of me, sitting down, right? And I was sitting beside the mixing board, beside Errol and Marcus over that way. And, but I wasn't paying much attention to Joke. I was listening, see if I could hear what he was talking about, right? 
And all of a sudden, I hear a shot rang out, you know. Joke take out him gun and fire a shot in the corner right beside me. <laughs> right? And he said, he said, that damn rat. <laughs> right? There was no rat there, right? You know? There was no rat there. He just wanted to <laughs> get us listening, you know what I mean? Saying that we, we, we are we are ugly, you know. Yeah, the, the, that shot was so loud, man. I just jump and you know, <laughs> but that's joke, you know. Actually, at Studio One, we were the first to be recording strictly local music. And um, I think because of that, I had the edge over the other producers who had to rent a studio or whatever it is. And then um, the 60 was a very good period for me because I went into strictly um, building of artists, you know. I'm in a dancing mood. I'm in a dancing mood When you feel the beat You got to move your feet You got to clap your hands You got all the soul Deep inside Cause you can hide I'm in a dancing mood I'm in a dancing mood Just wear some shine suits, man. We're telling man, um, is that first time, you know, it was more uniform more than now, you know. So we had to go to a tailor and get some flashy suits and stuff like that. If you can look at the Clarence Bonans, um, help me when I was small, is that we had some flashy things going on, you know. At that time, I don't feel I would really like wearing them, though, you know. <laughs> Very man, very man. <laughs> it was so exciting and feel so good to know that because really Wailers was the upcoming group at the time. As a young group, it was more revolutionary in those days. And there was a group of young people going with. And to know that I was among Wailers and they are the one that bought my first recording. It was very exciting, you know. Lovely, shoot the one is the is where I really enjoy my youth. 
it was like a family feeling, you know. So even the whole artist was doing this also to help me to help the kids. Well, I, I guess um, the, my other competitors, or the people in the business, um, didn't have much faith in the business because um, I think I was the first black man to really start with this as a business. You know, both having the studio, having the, um, the shop, the record store, and even started to export the records. In order to accelerate economic development and to raise living standards, Jamaica is putting increasing emphasis on producing and manufacturing for export. What was originally produced to meet the demands of the domestic market must also now be suitable for export. These products must meet the high standards of quality set in the international marketplace and have a distinct Jamaican characteristic in craftsmanship, content, and design. At that time, we were, I was weak to music. Wherever it goes, it lowered me, you know. Wherever we would know that uh, a bunch of uh, musicians get together playing, we'd find ourselves there and listening. <laughs> They used to play in the hills, Warwick Hills. They used to rehearse there. And um, I used to attend rehearsal and things like that. And then the idea came up that I would really keep a dance in the city here with my sound system plus their drums. And we had that at the Success Club on Monday night. And it was 
great success, you know. When I left the military band, I also left home because I'm um, getting involved with Rastafari at that time. You automatically became an outcast. So um, you had was to find some Rasta bridging where you could go and, you know, spend your time, you know, and I, I chose Countess because um, I was in love with the way that they play the drums there and I, I, I like playing with the drums, so I chose that area to really spend most of my time. Two, they were playing drum, a lot of the wind instrument used to go by them as a means of rehearsing. Such as? Yes, um, Johnny Moore, Dan Drummond, Tommy, Seymour Roland. What, and the cameras, he didn't mind that? He thought that was... No, he loved that because that was um, big and in, in his area. He was the big guy because you have, you know, a sort of top musician coming by his place. <laughs> We are now entering P.O.R.A. famous Monday night dance hall. Welcome. Come on in. Good day, good day, good day, good day. So this was where we had the sound system set here yeah, on stage. And then this would be the dance hall. You had speakers like right in front here. You had speaker at each end of the dance, and then the rest of the speaker would be outside on the lawn. So, so what would people be wearing? In our suits or shirts? No, no the, um, casual. At time, um, 
jeans was in, the dangaree, you know, everybody, yeah, yeah. But for this climate down here, the suit wasn't the right thing, you know, just a t-shirt or What did the, what did the women wear? They were nice, crazy clothes, but yeah. Did you, and did you, did you ever come with your wife or did she not come? Well, um, once in a while, but you know, it's best to leave the wife to take care of the home while you take care of the business. Uh, yeah, this is Rosemary Lane, you know. Yeah, outside here, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and the bar used to be in just that little section there. And we said the bar where you serve the, the drinks and the curry goat and whatever. So, so um, how would people know to come here? Yeah, yeah, you have flyers out, you promote it. And even like the night of the dance, we used to have a car with on playing the music and announcing the dance and throwing out flyers, you know. And did you have like banners or anything up? Yes, yes, for, because um, two weeks before the, the, um, the day of the date of the dance, you'd have a banner out there and you'd have your regular in invitation that you give out at least two months prior to the dance. Two months? Yeah, that's right. And you're f this is where you're from, isn't it? This is where you grew up? Yeah, yes, yeah, all this area, yeah. So did you know most of the people? Though? Yeah, we know most of the people, but you see, actually, what really draws the crowd is the dance promoter. You can yeah. walk from here and go right up there. No, you, you can't can go that. Every dance song, five dance keeping tonight. And we're going to go all them, and we're going to walk. Dance we go. From one to one, yeah. and a bunch of us. So you think that's and nothing wrong, I'm but things change. Yes, yeah. life changed. Yeah, right. These new yeah. people grow up hostile and vile. We don't ought to go with them. So we keep our cool while they end up like a fool. Yeah. yeah they come, <laughs> they come <laughs> to the bar. Yeah. They come to the bar and they order the drink. We take a, they don't we want just to take a yeah. quick one over there. Yeah, we're going to set up people. Our friend's place. It's a PMP place in this school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's fine. Uh-huh, bye, bye. Old time, last street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to East, East Branch too. too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. This is Rosemary Lane. Right down to Melbourne. Rosemary Lane. That's right. Rosemary Lane. Yeah. Right When I hope here, we didn't have a store at the front. We had a um, store on Orange Street and Beeson Street. And there's another store I had on East Queen Street and Duke Street. And the third store I had was Beckford Street and West Street. That was in a nice busy area where country folks come and sell their um, produce, you know. We were importing record and also selling local record 
you understand? But um, I wasn't really pinned down. I always had somebody to take care of the store. Then I'd float around doing me other stuff, recording and enjoying yourself. Yeah, enjoy yourself, yeah. It's be because of that, 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 that drive, why there was a studio one of such. In, in, instead of making some money and buy a nice house uptown and cut him ten, him take that money and him build a studio. And when the studio start working, he buy, him buy a prison plant. And when the prison plant start working, he make a restaurant. And then he make a printry. And everything was going back in the business. And he was just behind it like that. A lot of other producers take the money and go into building house, or uh, you know, buying property and and buying drills, you know, and going to different business, so to speak. It's just one direction, music, music, for Coxon, ever since. Yes, I'm Sister Ignatius from Alpha Bow School. I came to Alpha Bow School in 1939. Render your art and not your garments. The truth is there for who have eyes to see. Our charity has no place in this judgment. Remember the words of prophecy. Children run, come to truths and rise. That's what I'm about. You know the truths and rise. Teach it to the children. You know the truths and rise. Teach it to the children that they should know. So what musicians went to Alpha? Well, uh, Lenny Hibbert, Johnny Moore, uh, Tommy McCook. Render your art and not your garments. The truth is there for who have eyes to see. They were the one who was turning out the very good news, you know away from the harm, uh, uh, army. And even the musician that came from the army didn't have the flex that those coming from um, Alpha, the ones coming from the army were too militant, they're too straight. The guys coming from Alpha had a soul of their own. They could solo and feel the music. We did a little beat version, some Verdi, some Bach, um, a little Tykowski, a little La Salle, I think, Verdi, Wagner, the, the, the scope was wide. Sister Nature seems to know you quite well. Oh, no, she's a darling. So nice she, lady, yeah. When did you first get to know each other? Well, yes, from um, Don Drummond's time. But she's so with it that she could arm any of Dan Drummond's song just like that. Well, we had um, a song system, which I bought for 35 pounds um, from an old boy. Um, and we used to play on Saturdays, that they would play dominoes, dance, discover, because they liked to dance in those times. And the ska had its own movements, etc. So we played, say, from after lunch till about five. Remember I said if you were then we would pack up and go. Remember the words I am saying to you right now. And for tomorrow, and henceforth I say, render your arts and not your garments. The truth is there for who have eyes to see. Partiality 
has no place in this judgment. I was at Treasure Isle Studio and I went to do a show in Harborview for the government. It was some holiday and I and Supersonic, I was the backing vocal, I was the lead vocal to Supersonic on that night in Harborview, open air show. And there was like a school band who played before us and the school band went on and playing and I see this little guy, you know, all over the piano, upside down on him foot on him head. So I run back to him and say, yo, no, come here, come here, watch this little youth here. And the youth was all over the keyboard like it's nothing. That was Jackie Me Too, you know. It was Jackie Me Too. Jackie, one of the things on which we're not very clear is the actual precise place where reggae might have begun. This studio would seem to me to be as good a place as any, as you were one of the first people, one of the pioneer keyboard players in this development. Can you tell us possibly where it began, if this was really the place? A lot of people have a lot of different places in mind, you know. But personally, my feeling is the whole atmosphere of where I am right now where everything was sort of created around what's happening in the get today. Listen here, I'm totally together. I, th I thought he was young, so maybe he was about 17, 18, you know. But he was playing with, with another band at that time. The she yes, uh, the sheiks or something like that. Like he came to the studio as a, as a youth, you know, going to college every day, and he came from college and began to play at the studio in his uniform. And this go on for like for like about almost a year. Him coming and play part time until one morning now. 11 o'clock, is Jackie come to the studio, no school uniform. I say, yes, that's the end of college. No more college for Jackie, me too. And then he came here and he got the job because Monte, Monte Alexander had migrated to the States. You understand? Because sometime even, after session and everybody gone, we'll be having a couple of drinks and planning what's the next group for tomorrow and things like that. And um, he's there playing and we're having a ball and things like that. When the time comes for the arms, it's Jackie counting the arms and go back to the PM and him counting the bass man and him play the bass note first until the bass is what to play to the song and the bass man play it and find it and him say yes let's go and even the singers, people like me who didn't have a musical schooling there are certain, certain time that my timing would be out and his Jackie would tell me wait and bring me in at the right time he was a god It's always difficult to kind of trace though, you know how these things happen when very often they're organic. But can you perhaps recollect some of the instances where you felt that this was really, yeah, I'm in on the creation of this thing? Yeah, well, most people know that. People who really are associated with, like, real good music, like jazz music, jazz lovers, mostly they know exactly the roots of other types of music come from in Jamaica. So even from the 50s or 60s, people realize that reggae has its stand right around this ground. Yes, well, I, I'm Rick Barker, uh, from Studio One, and Bad Taste's best friend is Rick Barker, for Bad Taste's my friend, says so. Silver 
course, uh, an engineer, electronics engineer. My name is Earl Walker, but my ordinary name that they gave me is the Great Banda. <laughs> I'm Sylvan Morris, um, an en engineer that worked at Studio One within the period of the 60s, 1960s. Uh, I was here for roughly about eight years, you know, in, in which period we did a lot of um, recordings, uh, which eventually uh, became famous, you know. The musicians, they were in house and they they sort of make you felt, you know, in the groove whenever they were, they were doing anything, you know, it was a, it was a groovy thing. You know? We had Jack Me Too at the time, which was the main arranger. So it was really a, a picked band, you know, like Leroy Sibley's was one of the man who played uh, uh, the bass, you know, and Rick Abaka, uh Eric Freiter, he was the, the, um, the guitarist. I remember Phil, there was a chap by the name of Phil who used to play drums at one at a time. We also used like Horsemouth, you know, and uh, Robbie Lynn. He came on roughly after, after uh, Jackie Mitu had left, you know. But Jackie Mitu was one of the main guys who, as you say, got the groove together, you know. The and he would take charge for Yes, the sessions, you know. And he was a lot groovy cat, you know what I mean? We would do like the rhythm tracks first, right? And then afterward, no, we would, we would, we would overdubs like the voices. Sometimes, depending upon the type of tune, we would probably do some horns, overdub horns, you know? Depending upon the type of tune, you know? This is like a two track machine. Yes, so we'd actually uh, run it from one tape to another tape. So sometimes we'd have three, three um, sessions of dubbing. So did the quality not change? Or? Well, uh, being the type of person that I was, right, because I did the maintenance and thing all the machines, so I kept them up to such a standard that you hardly noticed it. I mean, you'd get some slight depreciation, but it wasn't really noticeable. So, so what are some of the singers that you backed? Uh, oh, I do with all, um, Larry Marshall, Eptones, Ken Boop. I play for Ken Boop, I see talking for Eptones, they be true. Fat girl, head tones, can move, moving away, don't move, move, say that, that's it. Uh, Mr. Dodd, while thinking within his, himself to enhance music, he had bought a piece of equipment. The name of it was Sound Dimension. Now, in those days, it was a, a loop tape. And this, this is like a tape player, record player, but it had three different heads, right? And one of the head was movable. God, in those days, it was an electronic relays and echoes and things. So you had bought this thing, which at that time was an advanced piece of equipment, with just a loop tape. So you'd record, send the signal in, and you'd pick up back the signal so you could actually move the tape head, you know? So what they did was to put the guitar, what we did was to put the guitar on this piece of equipment, right? So when Eric Freighter played, you got this check, check, right? And this, I think, was one of the things that started the reggae because it, it actually came not just by, by, by thinking alone, it came by sound also, you get me? So this was where it started. So this piece of equipment was very important. But I could tell you what really gave us that, that kick is that in, um, guitar going through that uh, acoplex, and that fold uh, a double sound on the guitar, instead of you get that crack 
going up. It was going uh, 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 uh. So we started to complement it with the piano and the um, clavinet here. You see, and when you play that style now, Mr. Dalla machine there that gives an a, a, a echo back, a drag bar, an echo, a special. And you see, you see just in reggae, Mr. Dalla machine, and I play the guitar, I go so one time and it goes so, and it goes check it. I go so one time and go check it. And we all just glue to that sound. Because at that time, we had like um, Nanny Goat, Baby Why, Love is a Pleasure. And if you listen to those, you'll hear the definite changes. Yes, hello Cabral, rent and tax attire. Um, um, who done it? All them special instrumental, who done it? Ram Jam, Fat Girl, the same friend. Girl, I've got a date. Yes. So after really getting stuff like that and testing it with the uh, and the dance hall and see how the people you know react to it. Then we use the same process and try and glue other things to it and there comes reggae. There's another thing that um, Jackie Me Too did, which I have seen in the world. And now, if he was to, to use a bass line and became a hit, you would turn the bass line backwards. So you play the same bass line, but playing the, the back to the front, instead of the front to the back, you get me? How it feels, my heart with memory, that I love. play for all them artists. Robbie Lynn, no, it's Jackie Me Too, yeah. And Robbie Lynn, sex, 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 yeah. And me, Rico Barker, they turn the And the bass, the bagger, bagger play bass there. Yeah. Did you record a lot with Eric, Eric Freiter? Too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, there would be a lot of jollification because I can be totally frank to you. I would say about 75% of the truth. We, did. we could tell right away. There are certain tunes that, that really uh, fooled us. Some of them that you think, you know, wasn't so great. And later on in the year, it could become greater than even what you thought was good, you know. This is the, the, the nature, you know, of the music, really, you know. So, how many records do you think recorded at Studio One? Oh, gee, I can't check them, man. So much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone was a hit. I mean, when they played here, you see. The first thing we have to go inside that room where the fellows are over there. And they say, hit. And you see, and the student here, and that man said, that told me, I say, yeah, hit, hit.
when you have a hit record, everybody try to duplicate the sound. If it's not like the exact sound, but they try to work around it and break it down. So everybody started to go into that direction just after that. So that's why that's why reggae became huge because it was the first one everyone was copying. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And did that make it more fun for you or worse? Or no, it make it more fun for me because um, we was always in front, and up to then, you see, what I had over the the average producer is that it was an everyday thing for me. As a matter of fact, sometimes. I went to bed humming a line that I want to put into a song tomorrow. <laughs> I have to just hold that <laughs> so that I don't forget it tomorrow because I'm not able to write as a musician. So whatever sound or idea, I had to try to glue it here so that I wake up back in the morning. So even over supper, I'll be humming or whatever it is, uh, yeah, so it was really nice. Did your wife not mind that? No, she don't mind. <laughs> she swing to you though, you're a nice person, you really swing. Well basically your whole life, you were just seven days a week making music. Yeah, 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 yeah. That even some of the time she couldn't believe that I'm coming from the studio, she figured I'm coming from a lady's home, you know? <laughs> she couldn't believe it's all that but you enjoy I enjoy what I did you know my whole life so I was living at fifth street but Marley lived at third street in fact Trenchtown is where the regular music really you know is the birthplace. All the singers them start from First Street, come right up. All spear singers right up to 12th Street, Toots and the Meters. 12th Street is the last block. And you have Lassell Perkins, 4th Street. So all the way up is just every street you can find two name artists. And my street, 5th Street, that was where Marty Planner was living at the end of my street. Undaunted by the driving rain, a sea of faces awaited at the Palisados Airport the arrival of a living legend. To some, he was the King of Kings, the Lion of Judah, even a god. But to most, he was a mild-mannered monarch who had won the respect and admiration of Jamaicans. The air was charged with excitement as anxious, expectant faces searched the skies for the first glimpse of the great silver bird that could bring their hero to Jamaican soil for the first time. Members of a local cult, the Rastafarians, who are easily distinguished by their long beards and unshorn locks, and who worship this figure as a deity, were present in full force. Okay, when we when when we started the roots songs now the real um, hardcore root song. This is when the Rastafarian culture begin to creep, tie up, creep into the music and begin to link with us, you know. Marty Planner is the leader of the Rastafarian organization. And at the, in, in 72, the government sent a delegation of Rasta men to, to Africa to um, analyze the Rastafarian situation and to come back. And so when, when Planner gets involved with the recording business, all of us begin to gather in Planner Yard every day. You understand? All who was interested because a few artists. If you're not even interested, that yard becomes the, 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 the base for all the musicians after a time. Nothing to a 
All the news are named them. Anyone, any, 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 anyone, man, Mark, uh, um, Rule and Alfonso, Jackie Me Too, um, the realers, that's where the realers get their inspiration. Myself, all of us used to be there on and off, on and off, smoking herb and playing music, reading Bible. That was the three main thing. Smoking herb, reading the Bible every day, playing music and listening to the, 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 the Rastafarian doctrine and where it's coming from and where it's going. There I met up on Peter Touch and you know, sang some songs to him and told him that I would like to get in the business. Well, he took me down by Second Street the night. There I met Bob and Bunny. And a whole lot of things was going on. The cooking and herbs are burn and man hiring, you know. Planner, Martin McPlanner, all them guys that was there. I follow his imperial majesty teaching. It's the last way them talk about. Not talking about no God, no, no. Talking about a man who who is teaching is very relevant in this time. Cox and, 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 and Martin Planner was good friends. It was good friends. In fact, they are age bracket people. You understand? And one of one of one of Planner's close friends was the drummer in, in Bob Marley group. Seiko, fan Seiko played the percussion. And this is why Seiko was always with Bob, because that's where Seiko saw Bob first and took him by my hand and take him to Mr. Dodd.
I stopped sound system about early 70s. But at that time, I was supplying 90% of the um, sound system dub. We had a dub machine, and uh, this is another thing that helped the music a lot. The, the sound men came, and we would suggest certain rhythms to them. You know, they ask what good you have, what you have that's good, and then we would suggest certain things that we heard that we thought, and they would listen it and say yes, and we give it to them, and they would sort of promote it. But what they did was sometimes they would actually change the name of the tune, and the reason for that is if another sound man come and wanted it, then you know, it's like even would know which tune to got tune, they change the name. When the song man asked which tune that, you know, they gave it a different name than what we gave them. So when they came and asked why I want this tune, they don't know which tune it is. <laughs> so they had a lot of rivalry that way, you know what I mean? Trying to hide the sounds, you know what I mean? Sometimes 200 people in the yard at time. Believe it, all musicians coming from the country, everybody trying to be a singer, and and you know, we'd love to see all the great people come to meet us. They hear about Alton and Lisan, the F200, and people come there just to meet us, in the sun, from abroad and up from uptown and things like that. Whalers, Gaylas, Dera Wilson, Marcia Griffiths, Babande, you know, you name them. We're talking about the first set of guys for Sir as younger folk. Um, we will as go over there writing a song in, on the same premises, and I go over there, and Gail is over there. And then sometimes the whole of us writing a song together. We're not teaching each other. We don't teach each other. But there's strong competition going on. But not with no, not with no corrupting, no corruption within us, you know? But there's strong competition because when a guy here, you do a good song, you know? Move him ahead, he wanted to do something to counteract that one. You see what I mean? That's what it used to be, you know? We used to be nice, man. Happiness always. That's why the music then used to be so nice. My other greatest tune, Time Bend Down. This is the thing that the best could be tune to bend the least volume for sounds in the ground. Now here comes a musical bit to make a jump and twist and get the good bit down the road. Boom shot. Yeah, it was like a maze with people 24 7. When Cox and Mother will be cooking the best two peas round here. So you have no problem. If you're hungry, you have food to eat. No problem. Just hanging out in there, smoking a lot of herb, and playing on the tree with a guitar. Did some time with you, teaching Dennis to play a guitar for days. Dennis Horace and Sandy. Uh, his two other people come to mind immediately. I was the, 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 like, like a bigger brother to them. Every time I want to find my guitar, it's either Dennis or guitar or I have to go and search over next door to find them with my guitar, you know, and things like that. But we just hang out. It's the best place to be. This is Youth Promotion Center, as you know. We are um, 1979, coming from out of the ghetto, Maxine Park and all of that. We're just trying to refurbish the centre and set it up different. This is the artist. I want you to take some of this to Studio One. See, we start off with the legend over here, you know. It's the Ken Bo. This is my teacher. This is, this is my greatest, greatest inspiration in Studio One music. Then comes Alton Ellis. Then Dennis Brown. Dennis Brown was the youth that inspired us, that let us know that youth could do something in music. Dennis Brown, never forget that. He's, Dennis Brown is the head for all of us, all youth. In music. Freddie McGregor, my best friend in Studio One for years. Eris Handy, Barry Salmon, he used to be our rival. From, he used to be like Mary Town, Soul. They used to put Barry Salmon against us, you know, rather. And he always used to win because the society they said, oh, Barry Salmon. <laughs> Errol Dunkley, Frankie Paul from Channel One Days, which is a good artist at Channel One. I put him up there. Michael Rose, when I went to Tubby's, the uh, Waterhouse, first person I met, Michael Rose, on a fence, no shirt. Barrington Levy, first time I heard him, he was singing my songs. 
And they say, go on and sing. I said, no, leave the youth alone. He'll be right. He'll flap me. Because he's a kid, right? Melodians represent Treasure Island music that we love. The Eptones, the greatest group ever come in reggae music. Eptones, remember that. Eptones, there's no sound like the Eptones. That's just the, Eptones on top is the best album ever made in Studio One. Right, better than mine, for real. Them and they drive me crazy with the melodious harmony and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And they were really, really successful, weren't they? Very successful. I admire the group so much that I realized uh, to keep a group like that together. I had to really carry them. I had a place on Beechwood Avenue. I boarded them there, gave them three rooms up there. And uh, I decided to help um, Leroy by purchasing a bass guitar. Because was he just a singer? Yeah, he was just a singer. A singer. Yes, and I showed him that, you know, wasn't strong enough to bring in an income. Wrangling, shooting, how to play the bass guitar, and then he got a lot of help from from Jackie me too, because uh, basically Jackie could use his left hand on the piano and play the notes that he needed to play. here, learning and earning. In the early 70s, it was obvious that we was the, um, the top um, studio releasing records of the artists, so New artists flop here on Sundays. On Sundays we had our audition. And then um say so maybe I get here by ten o'clock. Um they would be out front. I would come to the gate. Sometime I would ask other artists or musician to assist me by going quickly through the bulk of artists and um, just let who sound even halfway distant and I'll deal with them. A song to Sir Dad, which is Coxon, Jackie Me Too, Lee Scratch Perry, and Bim Bim. Those were the first four persons I sang to. Peter, Peter Touch was the one who played the guitar for me because at that time I couldn't play the guitar. And I sang four songs. And Coxon stopped me, asked me where I'm from. I told him I'm from Port Antonio. He said, OK, don't sing anymore. Come in tomorrow. <laughs> so how many would be there at the start? Well, um, certain Sunday you'd find um, maybe a hundred artists or more out there. So then, you know, we, we had to really filter it out and uh, let the ones that sound not too bad, I deal with them. Don't call me Starface. My name is Capone. C A 
P-O-N-E ポポンアルコポン Sounds to make you skip and flip and dip you with the shine of funny trick and this release comes from awesome minds to the basket Sounds to make the groove and dumb the groove and we've got to make a move Boom shot Ook Lainan Sinka Ook Bak Spanish Amiga Beat that jump From the number one station Here comes This is Lone Ranger live and direct at a place called Shudo One. Tell about it. The band I came here um, with the band Soul Defenders. And what, what period was that? That was um, 1970. Well, the band played together at Studio One until 1976. There was a nucleus of musicians that were always here. Today, um, Leroy Sibbles, um, Baga would be here, and he had um, the same guitarist I told about, Ron and Rika Baca. He was a lead guitarist. And uh, we had Cedric Brooks play the um, saxophone. Um, sometimes Roland Alphonse and Tommy McCook. So did you take over from Leroy Sibbles, really? Yeah, well, we, we both was here at the same time, you know, because mainly he was singing, you know. But we both was here together. And he played a lot of great bass line too, you know. But he wasn't that, he never knew that he would come to this, you know. But he play, he's have a long finger, and you can stretch and you know the music, so he's good, you know, he's good. So what's the difference in your styles? Not really different. I'm just playing for such a long time, that's why I just good, so I just know it's bad, you know. I can do any work, any work. <laughs> Even Pavarotti, you know, any work. <laughs> the Soul Defender's name isn't as well known as some of the others. No, but we, we, on... we played um, with different names. We played as Sound Dimension, we played as Studio One, All Stars, we played as Brentford's Road, all stars. Brentford Disco set? Yeah, we had underground vegetables. <laughs> we had a lot of names. Yeah. And what are some of the favourite records that you recorded at Studio One? All kind with? of record. I can't count. I can't say. <laughs> you know. But there are any you remember? Well, that no, was I can't yeah. count. I can't all, say. All Just yeah. Horace, well, Horace and they used to call him Sleepy, you know, because he was, you know, it's, by the time you start talking to me, or by now you'd be asleep somewhere about <laughs> Yes, he used to sleep a lot, you know. Yes, or Sunday again, um, he came in, but I had like um, or Sunday for that unique voice, you know. His voice sounded to me different and more like a youth, although he was a grown up. Skylarkin, Skylarkin, that is what youths do today. Skylarkin, Skylarkin, before they stand up firm on their feet, begging you a five cent, sir, begging you a ten cent, sir. Can at hell, no can at hell. So if y'all keep on doing what you all are doing, you will get the south of ye. <laughs> The double LP was one of the things that was responsible for breaking new DJ artists because they had the rhythm now to rehearse on, you know, day to day until they get perfect. I think I think they, they, the sound men were the ones who drove me into that area, right? Because sometimes what we did was we did we started to do the, the drum and bass on one track and like the rhythm is on one, you know? So, when, as we say, the, the musicians would come, the, I mean, the soul men would come, every man would like to get his tune sounding different. 
So in other words, we had given this to one sound man. Next sound man said, why make it sound a little different? You know what I mean? So that's how come now we used to drop in some of the things and drop out some of the things. You understand me? To give it that 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 version thing, if you understand me. So instead of just doing a straight thing, you know, we drop in a little, it's dropping out a little of that. You get me? To get it sounding different. So it's from right there now the version starting. Well, no, that now is dub. That now is, is, is dub. You're playing with the, the control and in and out with the guitars and the steady bass, drum and bass and drum coming at you. That is really dub. Yeah, man, without a doubt. Because it, it made you I become skillful in, 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 in trying to make a sound sound different. You have to use echo reverb in every fashion, you know. Some of the equalizers, sometimes some of the processors. You have to put them on the drum to make it sound bionic. You know, all kinds of things, you know. So we got, we got innovative, really. What get me hip now within the set, uh, early 70s? There was like say um, 60% of the, the sound system love my tracks, so they come on harder dubs. So because of the, 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 the dubs they are harder in, then you would be aware of that is the music of the day that is going. So maybe you just put a artist on it to do a new rendition to it. And that helped me to really keep with what's happening out there. This is Lincoln Sugar Vine at Air, singer, songwriter, producer, Black Roots Production, youth promotion organization. Originally, I come to Studio One Stable, Sir Cox and Dad, respect and one love and unity. I check myself as being the son of Studio One and SOS One. I'd know Studio One spiritually before I'd known Studio One physically. Like I was, you know, I grew up beside a dance hall that Sir Cox and Dad sound used to play, you know. So for those of boy, Sir Cox and sound. So from that influence, you know, I used to love Studio One music so much that I became a selector. You know, I was a selector, like sound selector. So that was my first involvement with getting to know Studio One music, the Eptones, you know, Leroy Sibbles and all those guys, like Alton Ellis, Ken Boot, old works, was my whole life for my youth. The thing with me, my audition was different. But like everybody was there with guitars and all that, and drums. I was there with just my voice. I didn't go with the intention for there to be a band or nothing like that. And then he took me, played the rhythm, spot on, because I was singing it so long, right? It was first time, boom, boom. So when you started singing over these, was it literally a revelation to Mr. Dodd that he's? Yeah, of... yeah, because like, this, Mr. Dad was thinking of making new rhythm because Mr. Dad is not a person that you know, thinking of repeating and he, he want to go on, right? But, but what was playing wasn't half as good as what was there. So, like, the rhythm wasn't good. So then, because I was used to sing this from sound system days, I had 20 songs already on Studio One rhythms. Here comes a guy who say, look, I can make these songs and these rhythms. I don't need a band. Then, here comes... Mr. DC, vanity, never gonna give you up. House is not a home, but just it's after it's. Freddie McGregor got re revived, but when I came with like, come down, Natty Jed, come right now. Freddie, Freddie instantly got a vibe and said, come now, sister, make it come right now. And that was one of Freddie McGregor's first big, then Bobby, 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 land. It started off all that all, whole new thing. So Freddie started singing on the same rhythm. Mr. Dad started putting everybody back on the same rhythm. So it's a whole new revolution. So you took, basically you're basically talking about the arrival of dancehall, which is when people That's started it. singing over. That's it, because there was a next period. Channel One started making over Studio One songs, disguising it, right? Like, like, instead, spam, ba da ba da ba da ba da da mean girl. But they play, spam, da ba da da ba da ba da ba now, Mr. Dad hears so much music, he, he's not going to record, he don't know that, right? But he said, doopy boom, poopy boom, boom, poop, poop, boom, right? So watch that, that's Mean Girl, right? But it, it's, I need a roof. 
So you're saying he didn't know? He didn't know. No. So I said, look, it's a die. Listen, that's me and girl, you know what I'm saying? Them say, let's go. Right? So we put our mean girl like, I need a rule. So that's that old people like, that's a diamond song. What? I said, no, but that's our rhythm. So you're responding to the versions, right? Yes. Yes. Reversioning. Yes. And there was that one like, man, if you run down your shadow now. Child one, we look, poof, hit that one before they release it. Where did they get that? But it was like teeth, and we taking it back. You know, so it was like, you know, the answer. I, I named those songs, answer my question. I named it, Death in the Arena, I named those songs. Because I was the only singer that could tape song in Studio One and take it away. You know, I could tape, nobody could tape, tape a song but me. So I named Death in the Arena, that's my song when, when King Tubbies was going to play Cox at, at, at Arena and we made that song overnight. It was an old song from Roland Alfonso and them guys, but we, we just gave it a name. So all these songs were renamed. They're not the original names of the studio. Only Mr. Dad know, know the real names of these songs, you know. Not even me. <laughs> I don't know. So that was a, 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 good, a good period to, to, to know that Trigger Mine had, you know, I'm Studio One, for real. And I mean, I'm Ken Boop. I'm Alton Ellis. I'm Dennis Brown. Yeah, that's me. All of them people. All, everything. I absorb everything from all of them. You're saying Channel One, but it was dance, it was just everyone. No, but well, Channel One was the uh, main start. This was the beginning of it. Everybody never started. Channel One first, then Joe Gibbs the, and the professionals, which was using the same Sly and Robbie and same Sly and Robbie. So it was version for version. Then he was looking back their sound, but it was our original rhythms, which, which Mr. Dad wasn't getting no, there's no publishing, no money. People just do it, you know. It's all fresh. All become new, it's a recycle. Your life depends on your corporate, damn right. You all gotta make things great, you pop into the game. So true. Play the music great, you can pop on the game, you call the body face. This is what I appreciate, y'all. So long time I'm a DJ in a down. Long time I'm a chant in a down. We come to nice up the area. We come to nice up Jamaica. But watch your man. Dance up the call, dance up the call. Leave Christ alone, leave Christ alone. Sha la 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 la. Sha la 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 la. Born on me grow in the ghetto. Born on me grow in Jamaica. Born on me that now I live me get to you. Me say me now live Jamaica. Go watch your man. And your papa smile go on a dance And your papa makes you go on a business. I sell road, I sell regulars. Man, how you keep your fitness? Man, I tell me how you keep your fitness. Oh, Papa, me. Love is all about it. Your love is all about it. Till the book, the thing you keep you rocking and sing. Cause every man do a thing. And sing, and sing. Keep you rocking and sing. And sing, and sing. To love the man who did your rubber dog. Love the man who did your rubber dog. Come be nice up the party. In the seventies, we stopped playing at dances and whatever it is because we felt the behavior of the fans wasn't too right. They couldn't go on all night anymore because if, if it's not the, the, the rude boy gonna shoot up the dance, is the police. If it's not the police gonna shoot up the dance, is the soldier, right? So dance, you, you know that very rarely a dance is gonna go through. It was about the time when it started really shooting up dance and getting on. Oh, so it got a bit dangerous? Yeah, it got a bit dangerous. So I figured I've had my fill with it. The violence in Jamaica, a lot of people think that it's an island-wide thing. It's not an island-wide thing. It, it, it's restricted to certain areas. You know, if you have a good sound in Jamaica, bad man like good things. Bad man like the best things, as a matter of fact, right? Bad man like to wear the best clothes. They like to um, drive the best cars. They like to listen to the best music. So wherever there's a DJ that is happening, the rude boys, they are going to be there.
I'm really happy about uh, that part of the continuous sales of my product, you know. And um, what I think is the time it we put into it, and um, lyrically we stayed close to the music because I try to be part of improving the lyrics at time. And um, away from that, we, we try to make every song sound different. And um, even each song, we try to make, even the introduction could give you a hint of what's coming because it sounded different from the other song. And um, in the early days, we went in the studio with um, people like you in mind, you know. We was not just recording for ourselves. We, we tried to do something that, well, as we would term it, some people other part of the world would accept, you know. There are a lot of songs that um, producer would go in and make and it's just good for the highland here. But we really was thinking of maybe you, <laughs> you understand? All sounds are good in town, but when Sir Cox would like him, stick is not around. Run is for snort or sound, I can stick as part the musical knockout. You'll hear the sound system men refer to dub plate. This dub plate would be um, at times a uh, 10 inch with four different music tracks on it. And um, in the whole song, dub is really the backing track of a vocal. <laughs> <laughs> Now as I dip down my musical dub selection box, still one find it run to one you run you hot. Boom shack, chill about it. Well to be honest with you, my favorite song is a song called Power Version I did for Studio One. All studios. Right? That's my favorite song. The Power Version, I love that song. Because I love the, the, the original song 
um, you can't be happy until you love someone by the Claridonians, right? I used to love that song. So when I went to Stido, when I asked Stido Morris for that reading, you know, I wanted to work on it, you know? And t- today is my number one song. Gather round is main king sound of blues Blazing all the musical discs you could never refuse Well, ain't no use of picking and choose For the stuff I really use And you gather sit back up in the way no bluff Is that a man called Lone Ranger Happens to be the musical prof Maybe it's because Sudo has got that musical stuff Tell about it You see, sometimes you play the original Then you play the version And a dub plate and they go wild Lone Ranger is the name and music is the game. Studio One happens to be the station, so black people run, come, let me give you a little demonstration about music education to higher generation, y'all. Boom shack, tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, I came to Studio One back in the days, like in 1976, um, 77, when I just graduated from school and to a Christian brethren who knew Mr. Dad. And every Sunday, we used to come and we used to rehearse. Rhythms, rhythms, rubber dubs, coxswains, rubber dubs. I used to practice every Sunday, and when we could master it now, he said, okay, we're gonna check Mr. Dad one Sunday. And we came here, this time it was me, Welton Irie, and Carlton Livingston. Three of us started together. So we came here, and um, me and Welton, we did a combination. The, the first tune for Shooter One was a combination tune with me and Welton Irie, a tune called um, Chase them crazy on the Mr. B.S. rhythm. Zora Sandy, you know? <laughs> right after that, now, me and Mr. Dad got together again and I did a tune called Love Bump, 1980. That was a, a true, you know? 18 weeks at number one. That stamper broke while Mr. Dad was away. And people couldn't get the record. And then Mr. Dad came down and he's like, so they told him and he came in and he pressed it. That time it, that it dropped to number three. It was at number one. And then when they couldn't get it, it dropped to about number two, number three. Or Mr. Dad came and he made back the stamper and re-released it again. It went from number three back to number one. That time, the only competitors I had that time was um, Ika Mouse with I do them, I do them, them, them. And General Echo with Arlena must a dream you are. You say no, the competition was stiff. So you know, he's, not a, he's not a producer that rush show or push things at you. I'm like, you come in and sit in first. You can't just come in and just, yes, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to do that. No, you have to come to Mr. Dan and you have to sit down and sit down a little bit and walk around the place and give him two talk and then you take time until you drift around the studio and then he says, Mr. Bell Jackson, which really me want, you know? He lets you choose. And when you choose now and then you start to record now, no matter how long, could be four, five, six, seven, eight hours it take. Him don't stop you until you feel comfortable with what you've done and you are satisfied with what you've done. My favorite rhythms are the original, like the I fashion, the rougher yet, the answer my questions. Mostly all the Coxon rhythms are my favorite because that's what I started off with. With Stoasters, well, you had Stitch, you had Dennis Al Capone, you had the great Uri and Jayut. But you see, Uri and Jayut, those were the two I hold on to when I was going to school. When, I used to, when my mother used to give me my lunch money, I said, well, here's the lunch money, go to school. You know what I did with my money? I went straight downtown to Randy's record and brought all the big youths and all the giant youth that ever released. I was at a dance one night and DJing was a sound clash, sound from east and a sound from west. The sound from west had a lot of veteran DJs. They had Dillinger, Trinity, big um, Dillinger, Trinity, Clint Eastwood. You remember all those west DJs? Kojak, good, all from west, coming to play in the east. And I was the king DJ in east. I was, I was the, the, the strong one in East. Me and Welton Irie, Johnny Ringo, you know? And we was playing at a dance, the one. The West song was playing and the dance was packed and all these DJs was coming across, DJing. And all these DJs had it tunes, had their name in the charts. Me, not yet. But I was good, but I was good in the ghetto. I, w- I wasn't exposed yet. And when it was my turn to go on now, I said, um, I took the mic and I said, Right now, because there was, remember, there was a lot of them, and it's just me one. So I said, um, right now, a bad damn Trinity. 
Tuffle and Eastwood, other than the Linger. My name is the Lone Ranger, that's why I act like a stranger, y'all. And from that night, the name stuck. So I'll just get that name and keep moving. Where does it start? And who are you? Show the one. My other greatest tune time bender, the best disco tender, the best tune to choose when the least of all losers sound to lift you off the ground. Now here comes a musical list to make you jump and twist and skip and flip and dip your hip and shine on funny trick. A musical list coming from out of my musical cocoa basket, y'all. Do it, yeah. Right? This is Lone Ranger. Peace. This is like a view at times that we go and check what was happening in the store at times. So the shop's in front of Yeah, yeah, the shop is in front of that. So it's like a little peak hole. Peak it? hole, that's right. And why would you need that? Yeah? Why would you need? Because we had a, um, a couple of breakage um, in the front there, stick up, actual stick up. With guns? Guns. Wow. Yeah. What, what in this Give me your money, babe. <laughs> when was that? That was, um, that started happening um, late 70s. Yeah. So that's towards the end where you're thinking, I've had enough of this? Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Because actually I was in one of the shooting up, you know. I came here one Saturday and Miss Dad sneak out came around here, I was in the passageway and she told me a stick up going on. So I went upstairs and went on the ledge and got around the front. So I asked the gate man to check out if whatever is happening. But like silly he came out and said, boss, a stick up going on and really so the guys follow him. <laughs> 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 but thank God, um, you know, I'm still here. But um, the guy, I, 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 I was lucky enough to shot him in the, in the hip. So the guys took him away, you know. Yeah. He, you shot him in the hip? In the hip. To defense, because he was feeling... Yeah, because oh. he was shooting at me, and I then started to shoot at him. He was actually him. shooting? Yes. So his friend um, caught him two way under the shoulder and run off up the road with him. Things were so bad in Jamaica, you couldn't get um, um, currency to purchase the material because at that time I was thinking I um, was depending heavily on the factory. So we needed to import pellets, you know, material, and there was no funds for that. So we decided to go. New York for a while. Because you was able to press in no quantity yeah. to export. So we took some tapes and went out. But keep coming to and fro. What do you think of your career so far? Well, I, I'm very thankful, you know. Um, as I would say, thank God, you understand? Um, it has moved from limb to limb, you know. And I'm still hoping that we still can achieve more as time goes by, you know. But on the whole, God gave me a very good mother. I can also say that as a wife, because 
my wife and family been very helpful, always there for me. And I've got long-standing friends, you know, who have inspired me to keep on going, right? And looking back, I'm very thankful for all the good artists and musicians that have worked with over the years. So no regrets. Still, I get the money, you know. This is, nice. this is um, Nanny's Corner. While over there was where my liquor store and where I started from, over here was my mother's restaurant and bar. And I used to run out of two for two, I wanted to to salute you. Champions found in the land. No son come. No son come. And he tore down. And he's still alive. When he released the satellite, crowd of people go to the dance hall at night to hear one, two release. Whether, whether it is Scandal, Roadblock, Tears Don't Fall, or Adam Zappel. You know? Some great tune, you know? Yeah. You got to be there to listen to that all your record. That night. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Student one is uh, coming like a coconut tree, you know? Instead of uh, a catch crop business. So I learned along the way to be more stronger, write good songs, you know? And be a star. Well, I never left Studio One yet, you know. <laughs> I never left Studio One yet. We just give him a walk and come back. <laughs> we used to play the sound system over there. And then my old lady, she had a, a business doing here. So we used to hang out and have fun and drink here, have drinks, you know. How old were you when you were there? At that time, I was about... Maybe 22, 22 years old. Nice, cool running, yeah. Man. But all them places, yeah, man, it's beautiful memory of places like this, man. Everything was cool and nice. Love me, dear. Why didn't you let me know? Darling, you have left me in tears, and I don't know what to do. I should have known from the start that you're not meant for me that you would break my heart and leave me here in misery. And ever since you left that night, my heart's been aching for you. There's nothing I do that can be right, cause I'm worried over you. If you didn't need my kiss, why didn't you let 
me know Darling, I just can't resist To tell you I don't know what to do I don't know what to do I don't know what to do That's beautiful, thank you very much Thank you